Coming up on the Mighty Rip Pod, I have a very special guest today on the big show. Now, I have I have pulled this guy out of the woodwork, who is now actually a a major Hollywood star. The uh, well, I don't know about major, but he is on a new Netflix documentary called Last Chance You introducing brad hoisev to the mighty rip pod community brad how are you doing today i'm doing great and it's uh fabulous to see my uh, longtime friend dave daba who uh, i believe we've had i don't know what a 25 year uh history between us at some point uh all the way back to our days of uh doing junior college football but it's it's great to be here nice nice now i i was i was uh like absolutely blown away when I, I saw this trailer for this, this show that was going to be on Netflix. And it, literally, like in the first 15 seconds of the trailer, there is my old friend, Brad Hoysett, sitting there uh, giving his uh, college football commentary. And I was like, okay, we got, I got I to gotta, uh, catch up with Brad, see what's going on in his world, and, and get him onto the big show. So Brad, uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, documentary. I, I know they just won an Emmy for last season. Um, are, are you hopeful that you're going to win an Emmy this year as well? Well, you know, I was hopeful for a red carpet run, you know, <laughs> if you will. Uh, no, you know, in all seriousness, I mean, I, I was more surprised than anybody uh, when they put me in the trailer. It, it um, you know, it wasn't anything that I expected. I flew up there twice for the show. I've been a fan of the show. They're in their fifth season, which is going to be the final season of football, unfortunately. But um, I, I'd been in contact with them really for quite a few years now, ever since they put out the first season when they were at East Mississippi. And, and then, of course, they were in Kansas for two years. And they decided to come out west. They wanted to come to California, and they knew I knew the landscape pretty well. So um, they gave me a call. Uh, I probably talked for an hour and a half, two hours with them. Uh, late in 2018, uh, they wanted some ideas where they go could go, and and they wanted to know how different it was going to be from being in Mississippi and then Kansas, and um, they they felt like I had a pretty good uh, idea of of the uh, the ge geography of it all, and so they decided to fly me up there twice during the fall for the show, and um, you know we probably spent uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of three hours on camera, which can be a little stressful at times, um, but at the end of the day, um, I thought it was, I thought it was a, a really good uh, show this year. I watched it, and the critics have loved it so far. For those that don't know what Last Chance U is, it's it's a docu series, uh, and they'll spend an entire season at at a junior college, and uh, they'll focus on on four to five different players every year and their struggles in life. And the show really isn't about football. At the end of the day. It's more about these kids and how they're using the game of football to try to, to try to enrich and better their lives. And so they brought me up there to add some context about the teams and the players and things of that nature. Uh, but as a general, uh, as a general rule, I think it's a really good show. I mean, uh, uh, like you said, they, they won an Emmys for uh, a sports Emmy for last season. Um, whether or not that'll happen again uh, next year, who knows? But I was just glad to be a part of it. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Far more entertaining than um, than the uh, HBO guys did with um, Hard Knocks last year and the um, uh, last year of the Oakland Raiders, which was, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how much you know about this, but like it was almost a total sham. It was almost as if the uh, Raider organization had had last cut authority on on what actually got uh, uh, got published during that. Now. Um, what, what's funny about this is, so, so, so Brad comes up and he's, you know, he's up here in the, uh, in the Bay Area and he's, he's doing his, his filming and he posts something, uh, he posts a picture of himself. Um, and I was like, I could sort of recognize the, the background behind him. Um, and, um, and so I, I pinged him and I was like, Brad, Brad, are you still, you know, I, I, I at the time I w was actually in China and I had just gotten back and I, and I pinged him and he had already, he had already taken off. I'm sure he, I'm sure these guys had him in a limo, uh, you know, and, and, <laughs> no. and, and took him into, they didn't just put him in any kind of Uber. 
it wasn't a you know a group Uber or anything like that. So um, so it was it was cool to see that uh, you know Brad was um, uh, was was making some inroads. Um, now, so they covered Laney College, which is um, really only about 25 minutes away from, uh, from, from where I'm at today, um, which is in uh, Oakland, um, California. Um, the head coach of, of, of Laney, I, I just, spend a, just spend a minute or two and just, just talk about this guy because he is um, a Bay Area legend. And, and I was really, you know, I think it was one of the things that was um, great about this show is, is how they, um, they sort of showed this, this guy that, yeah, you know, honestly could have gone all the way into the National Football League if he wanted to, but, uh, but chose to um, sort of stay behind and um, sort of build his career just inside this one community inside Oakland. Yeah, you, you know, John Beam has been a guy that's been around Oakland for a long time. And uh, really, before he arrived at Laney, they were not a very good football program. And so he had opportunities to leave and go other places. But he really was a guy that, and is a guy, that is really married to the community. And he wants to make positive changes in his own community. So he, you know, put aside his own, uh, you know, goals of maybe coaching at a higher level or something like that. And he decided to stay. And I think if you watch the show this year, there's a distinct difference between John Beam and the previous coaches, Buddy Stevens and Jason Brown. Um, John Beam uh, is a guy that really loves his players, and he's tough on them at times, and that's the life of a football coach. Uh, but I agree with you. I, I like the fact that they had a guy that really was into the community because this – the storylines this season were a lot more about the city of Oakland and the gentrification of the, of the town and um, how it has pushed, you know, a lot of communities outward and, and people are starting to buy up the neighborhoods and the houses have gotten way too expensive for people to live. And that was a lot of the story really this year. Uh, you know, they followed around one kid who was living in his car and living on couches. Uh, they followed another kid who had two kids of his own. He'd bring them to practice. Um, they followed another kid that commutes all the way from Stockton to, uh, to get to school every day. Uh, and they followed another kid named RJ Stern, who has a very interesting background in that, you know, his grandmother uh, wrote a famous book back in the 60s called The Miss of Avalon. And so the four kids that they chose to follow were, you know, they were very polished. They were articulate. They were bright on camera. And so, um, I thought it made for a really intriguing story this year. They've finally come to California, which is a very different system from playing in Mississippi and playing in Kansas. You know, the California schools don't have scholarships. They don't have dorms. And so, uh, whereas in past seasons, you know, they'd stuck a camera in the dorm rooms and just, it was easy to capture video of two or three kids at a time. You know, they spent a lot of times in cars this year uh, with the kids as they were driving home or driving into practice or wherever they were going. So, yeah. Um, you know, but John Beam, I think if you look at him as a person, he is a perfect Oakland guy. I mean, he's got this unkept mustache. Uh, he kind of looks like a cross between Raleigh Fingers and Al Davis, and he's perfect. He, he looks like a Raider. Suit the whole thing. He, he, he absolutely looks like a Raider. <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, he wears the sweatsuit like Al Davis used to wear for years and years, and he's got the mustache, which, you know, you know just tucks – it reminds me of the Joe Rudy days of the Oakland A's, you know, I mean, he's a perfect guy for the Oakland community and that program. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting, you know, how, um, you know, community colleges in, um, in California um, have restrictions that other, um, other uh, states don't have. Um, you know, one, the joke is one of the things that, uh, you know, every football program in, in the state of California has, has a requirement that they have to have at least five people on their team that are vegans, um, <laughs> which, is, which is, a, is a big part of, um, you know, one of the, uh, one of the requirements for, uh, for recruiting players. Um, so, Brad, um, real quick, let's, um, uh, let's shift a little bit, um, you know, off of uh, Last Chance You, which, by the way, it's a great show. Uh, when it came out during its first two weeks of, of release on Netflix, it was in it was in Netflix top ten 
in uh, in in the U.S., um, which is you know uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, highly recommend checking it out. Um, it's uh, it, uh, five episodes, um, way eight better. Episodes. Or, yeah, or sorry, eight episodes. Wait, <laughs> they added some episodes. Um, but look, wait, hey, look, I'm in five episodes. Okay, those are the ones to watch, people. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Watch, watch Brad in in those. So eight eight episodes. Um, check it out though. It's um, it it really is a great show. And and when you're watching it, um, you know, in this whole the the this brand that they've sort of developed for uh for Lance Last Chance You, um, I I think they've gotten better and better over the years that they've been producing these. Um, and um, they seem to you know always sort of hone in. And, and really find, um, you know, cool, unique stories. And, and unlike, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, HBO's um, Hard Knocks, it, it, it hasn't gotten old. Um, now, 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 Brad, I, I don't know if you had a, had a chance to watch the new Hard Knocks at all uh, last night, um, but it, it I deb- did not. Okay, it debuted on, uh, it debuted on uh, HBO, and it's, it's both the... <laughs> The Los Angeles Rams and the Los Angeles Chargers, um, and if if you didn't have a, if you didn't know who was talking, like Brad, you're you're a huge football fan, so so I I know you know who the the personnel are on the Chargers and, and you know who plays for the Rams and everything, but if you didn't know, you'd have a hard time actually telling if they were filming the Chargers or or the Rams, their their color schemes and their uniforms. And their practice facilities are almost identical. Um, so it was, uh, it was um, sort of uh, uh, interesting to watch. And of course, they spent the majority of the show on uh, COVID-related uh, related items. Um, yesterday with uh, the, the Big Ten's uh, a- announcement. Now, now for, for those of you that are just getting introduced to Brad Hoysett for the first time, he is... Um, outside of the great state of Minnesota, um, probably the biggest Golden Gopher fan uh, in in North America, and and so you know Hoyce has a big Big Ten guy who's been who's been stranded on a Pac-12 island for the, for the last uh, uh, thirty years or so in California. And um, how did you react yesterday? Um, when the Big Ten and the Pac-12, you know, basically joined forces and decided uh, to cancel the fall football season? You know, in the circles that I travel, it, it, to me it was a foregone conclusion a long time ago. And I, I still think that it's a real stretch to think that the Big 12 – and the SEC and the ACC are going to play football. I just do it. And look, look, I love football as much as the next guy, but, you know, college presidents are, you know, they're struggling with this thing. And, you know, there's the financial aspect of it and all those kinds of things. But, you know, just not being able to watch my gophers during the fall in what was probably the most anticipated season for the gophers in, I don't know, 50 years, maybe something like that. I mean, they're coming off a win against Auburn in, uh, what was it, the Outback Bowl or something like that? Yeah. And um, probably the biggest win, really, for the program. I mean, wait, wait, just, just the Ricky Foggy era, maybe. Maybe when <laughs> Lou Holtz was there. I don't know. I mean, it's been a long time. And so to have the season kind of just go away, even though I kind of knew it was coming, um, it was disappointing. Now, if they do end up deciding to play in the spring, for us football fans, guys like you and I, Dabba, you know, if they play the other conferences in the fall and then they play the Big Ten and the Pac-12 in the spring, we're talking about a nine-month window of football, which for the football aficionado is pretty sweet. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, and, and you can finally really have a, a true split national champion. <laughs> that, that, you have a Rose Bowl again, right? Yeah. You get the Pac-12 being the Big Ten – and have it in the Rose Bowl on uh, June fourth or whatever, you know. That's uh, that's that's funny. So, what do you, what do you think of the new um, uh, uh, this new regime uh, with the Golden Gophers that uh, that took over? Like, I haven't seen this much excitement since the uh, I don't know the Mason days of, <laughs> of the Golden Gopher program. 
But I mean, like, it, it, do you buy all of his? Is is he too hypey? I think he's a perfect guy for kids. Yeah, and I don't. I don't <laughs> know that he would ever work at the next level in the NFL. But he's a guy that can really sell a set of parents on on their son going to University of Minnesota. I mean, he's an excitable guy. Yeah. He has a lot of fun. I think he's positive. I don't think he's one of these guys that's constantly screaming and shouting and, and you know, shouting down a player in order to get results. Um, so I don't know that I could stand being around him for more than five minutes at a time. Yeah. But you cannot, you cannot argue with the guy's results. And certainly he has a real positive spin to him. And I think those are all good things right now in the world of football. So I'm all good. Just keep winning. Keep beating Auburn. And I, you can do just about anything in my mind. Yeah. I, I mean, <clears throat> and, and I thought it was important to point this out. Like the Minnesota golden Gophers beat Auburn in, in a, hey, that, hold on. I didn't hear that, you. Yeah, right. That, that's right. That's right. The Minnesota golden Gophers beat Auburn. And, and who was the head coach that led him to that? I mean, is it's, yeah, yeah. By the way, I have to give a shout out to uh, my hat here. By the way, San Francisco State, the uh, Gators. I know okay. you're a big Bay Area guy. Uh, my son goes to San Francisco State. Hey, I got a trivia question for you. Yeah. Can you give me the f- most famous athlete that ever went to San Francisco State? That's um, tough. Yeah, no, no idea. No idea. Well, first of all, there's two that are really famous. Well, they're famous to you and I. No. <laughs> okay. One was the defensive coordinator for the Minnesota, your Minnesota Vikings in the late uh, 1980s. Okay. Floyd Peters. Oh, Floyd Peters. That's yeah, huge. you remember Floyd Peters, the that's, Vikings defensive that's, coordinator? That's, that's huge. Yeah. And that's, the other one is not really an athlete, but he played an athlete in a movie. Carl Weathers. Oh, Rob- that's, that's, that's huge. Right? <laughs> and that is, that is huge right there. Right there, yeah. San Francisco State Gators. You gotta, you gotta love it. You gotta love it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, what do you think about the uh, SEC, ACC, and the Big Twelve? Just you know, basically, you know, it, it just baffles me. And we we did a um, uh, we published a, a, a story on this uh, on uh, on this yesterday um, on the uh, Mighty Dot Rip blog, and it was it was basically like you know college football is a total mess. And, you know, the, the premise of it is, is pretty simple. You've got, you've got five power conferences and, and, you know, two are making the decision to, to play in the spring, which makes Hoysa very happy, by the way. And the other three are, are planning on soldiering through. And they're all basically looking at the same exact medical information. How, how does this happen? Well, I mean, look, it's football is a religion in the South, and that's a reality. Yeah. And much like, not to transition back to Last Chance U, but Last Chance U, the first four seasons they spent in really small towns where football was king. And that was one of the discussions we had when they wanted to come out West. I said, you're going to have a different culture in California. And so when you get up in the upper Midwest and Minnesota and Michigan, and then you come out West to Oregon and and California and places like that for football, it doesn't have the same meaning every Saturday. And we love football, but it just doesn't have the same meaning that it does when you're in Alabama and Louisiana and places of that nature. And so at the end of the day, these football programs bring in huge amounts of money and, um, in many cases, they build the buildings on the campus. And so uh, they know that if, if they don't play football, they're going to lose a lot of money. And so, you know, at some point, you got to wonder when the kids are going to figure out that, um, you know, perhaps they deserve a little bit of that money. I, I'm not quite sure where that's headed. You know, I remember, what was it, five, six years ago now, Northwestern uh, wanted, to be, uh, wanted to unionize, stuff like that. Yeah. And I think that we're kind of headed in that direction. I don't know if something like that comes out of this, but um, certainly there's been talk of it. Um, but in terms of them playing in the fall, I mean, they're still planning on playing. And so, uh, you know, when people get sick and uh, they get the virus, then we'll see if they change their mind. But for now, 
um, they want that money, and uh, it appears like they're going to at least give it an attempt for now. But, you know, this stuff is so fluid, it changes, you know, it seems daily and hourly now. And so um, they may have a completely different mindset next Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it just, um, <clears throat> and, and the, the end of the article on, on, on the uh, Mighty Rip um, uh, blog, um, it, it basically says, but, you know, by the time this article is published, um, it's possible that the Pac-12 and Big Ten will have changed their mind again. Um, right. You know, yeah, it, it, you just don't know. I mean, like one week they come out with the actual schedule, and then the next week they go ahead and decide to um, push it back to spring, which, which by the way, as much as I love football, I, I, I just I don't see it happening in the spring. I, I, I think it just it causes too many, um, too many other issues for – um, for the players who, especially, you know, sophomores and, and juniors that are going to have to then, you know, suit up again in, uh, in, in the fall. And, and I know they're young and they can, they can play more, but um, it, this is football. I mean, it's not baseball where you could just, you can play it all year round and, and not have any, not have any issues. It's, it's not golf uh, <laughs> where you can just, you can play it all the time. This is football where, you know, when the season's over, you need, you know, a couple months of recovery, uh, you know, especially at that level of uh, collegiate college football, your body needs, uh, needs time to recover. So I, I, I think this is, um, you know, I, I think two things. One, um, if, uh, if the ACC, SEC, and, and Big 12 really are going to move forward and they really think they're going to be able to pull this off without being in a bubble, which seems, you know, highly unlikely. But if they do move forward, I, I wouldn't surprise me to see the uh, the, the Big Ten and the Pac-12 um, change uh, change their mind when they see how much pie is is on the table. Um, and and the truth of the matter is, you know, the Pac-12 and the and the Big Ten, uh, I I think are are really you know doing this. You know, sure they're they're, they're worried about player safety, but they're also worried about uh, lawsuits and um, things of that nature that, um, that could certainly take them down as well. But if, you know, everybody else is playing in, the, in major, uh, major football, it, 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 might, um, it might be a big enough uproar um, uh, for there to be a change there. But uh, f- spring season, as much fun as I, as, as much excitement as I have for that, I, I just don't know how it would actually work out. Yeah, it, it certainly seems like, an odd scenario. There's no question about it, but see, you're a basketball guy too. And you like basketball and you watch, yeah. you like watching all those nonsense sports as I call them. Uh, and you know, I'm a big football guy. So uh, I have nothing to watch basically January to August. So um, I might not feel that way if we get there about mid season, but if the Gophers are six and Oh, Dabba, if I know you, and the Gophers are six and zero out of the gate during that spring football. You'll be tuning in, my friend. Oh yeah, no, I I, I will be there, and I will, um, you know, continue to uh, heckle um, my Nebraska friends um, as much as as much as possible. So, um, um, but yeah, I I, I look, um, I, I will be there, you know, regardless of what month they decide to play, and it uh, if they play a game. On Valentine's Day, sorry, honey. Uh, it's a no-brainer, right? <laughs> it's, it's 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 an absolute no-brainer. I will I will be there for sure. The flowers will be there tomorrow, honey. They <laughs> they're on they're on the way. Um, yeah, uh, you know, one of these days, one of these days, uh, I am going to finally find a way to convert Brad Hoyseth into a National Basketball Association fan. It it is. It is, it is, it is going to happen. And then he's going to find himself in a sports world where he's no longer bored, uh, where he's, he's only reliant on the gridiron. And, and I love football as much as Brad does, but it just so happens that I also love uh, basketball um, as much as well. So hey, let me tell you something. I played basketball and so I got to high school and I wasn't bad. I was a little yeah. short. I was a good passer, uh, not a bad shooter. But there was a little bit too much running involved for me, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And so I watched basketball. 
I was a Showtime Laker guy uh, watching that. My dad was a Mikan fan. George Mikan, uh, he used to post yeah. when I was like three years old in the front yard, right? George Mikan, and I'm like, yeah, but dad, you're like 6'3", and I'm like, you know, two and a half feet tall. And so, um, you know, I grew up watching basketball. I love the game of basketball. And uh, for me, uh, and I know that the guy is the biggest name in the history of basketball, Michael Jordan, but, and arguably the greatest player. You could have, make an argument over that. But to me, when Michael Jordan came into the game, the game really changed. And it became less about the team concept and a lot more about the individual concept. And guys started getting calls. And to me, I, the game got a lot less interesting at that point. And so, um, you know, I will tune into the NBA Finals. I, you know, I mean, my wife says I'd watch two ants race if I had a chance. So that's not like I'm going to miss something good, right? But, but uh, to me, uh, the game is not. Uh, I don't want to say I don't want to use the word with the word pure, but it's just not as good as it once was when uh, you were talk when you had a name for a team. You know, yeah. no time Lakers. You know, yeah. uh, they had names for teams. Now they got guys. You talk about guys. Yeah, yeah, and it and it it's it's sort of like in the um. I mean, the NBA certainly changed. Um, what uh what what I like about it this modern sort of uh game. Um, and yeah, you know, being up here in the Bay Area, <laughs> it is it's been Brad. It's been tough being a a Laker fan up here. You know, for the last uh, seven or eight years, and and a Timberwolf fan as well, which is always a lifelong. Um, that's just uh, deciding you're going to suffer. Yeah, for the I got rest one for, for your Bay Area people. I got one for your Bay Area fans up there. One of my favorite players as a kid, Clifford Ray. Ah. Played during the Rick Barry era. Nice, nice. Yeah, I, know, I can give, I can rip a few off there for you, Dad. Well, well, and the, the best I'm not out of touch for that long. The, the, the best part about Rick Barry, right, is um, you know, in his <laughs> in in his post uh, post basketball career. So Rick Barry did a, a radio show up here for a while, and then um, and then he, you know, regime change, and he he moved on, and you know, so now he just does like guest appearances, <laughs> and and whenever Rick Barry does a guest appearance, he's always hawking something, like I don't know, you know, he could he could be like trying to sell, um, uh, he could try to be sell like um uh, like a sponge holder for <laughs> for your sink. It doesn't matter. Like Rick Barry is always selling something. And, and he gets on the show and he gives his basketball knowledge, which is fantastic and is absolutely awesome. And then, he, and then they allow him to plug you know, some URL, which, he, which, by the way, he always struggles to actually say um, and, and, and get right. But, um, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's a piece of work. But, but what's, what's interesting is, like, the way the game has actually changed um, and, and the scoring, the, the, the sort of like in, when you get inside the numbers – the, the, the numbers are pretty similar to, to what they were 30 years ago in terms of, you know, how many points are scored a game and, and that kind of thing. What, what's actually just changed is how the points are scored. Um, and, um, and, you know, with the, um, uh, you know, sort of the movement, you know, away from the key and spreading, uh, spreading the, the, the court out, it's, um, it's really sort of um, changed the game. And it, it actually sort of peaked a new interest in the game for me because I was like you, I was, I was sort of, um, you know, bored with um, sort of the flaunt hog, um, you know, basketball player that would, uh, would just control the entire game. Um, well, himself. here's the funny thing. As, as, as a Laker fan, I took very, very little joy in the Shaq Kobe era to me. Look, I, I love Shaq as a human being. He's, you know, I think he's done marvelous things for himself. Uh, but his style of play to me was, was like watching paint dry. To yeah. me, it wasn't interesting whatsoever. Yeah. So, like yourself, uh, I, I did take pleasure in watching the Warriors the last few years. To me, that was a much more enjoyable style of basketball where, you know, there was a lot of ball movement and that kind of thing. Um, kind of took me back to, to the olden days of basketball. So, that was kind of fun. But And I'm... Uh, I'm always at a loss for words at how well these guys shoot the ball. I mean, they're crazy talented, and they seem to be able to make shots from anywhere in this day and age. Uh, but that, you know, there's football out there, Dabba. You yeah. got to switch your focus back yeah. to football. I mean, I, that's. 
I, I know. And, 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 you know, I, I've got the you know, NFL network in, inside the training camp on, uh, you know, a good 10 hours a day in, in, in the home office. And, um, yeah, you know, so I, I am definitely, you know, gearing up for the, uh, for the national football league season. I mean, I, I can't wait for it to happen. I am, I am worried that the NFL, um, you know, has, has made a mistake, um, not attempting to move into some sort of bubble scenario, um, for, for this season. I'm, I'm concerned, um, you know, so concerned that I, I haven't, you know, honestly didn't even pay any attention to what was happening in the NFL after the draft. And, and that, that was because like, I just didn't understand how Roger Goodell was going to pull this off sort of in, in this, you know, pandemic environment and, and pull it off. Now, Major League Baseball, um, who, you know, had their major um, sort of issues <laughs> with the uh, with the Marlins and the Cardinals. And if those two teams proved anything um, or if Major League Baseball as a whole has proved anything, it's, it's that you can still go all plane trains and automobiles across the country and not be in a bubble. <laughs> you just got to keep your players out of the strip clubs and other late night establishment <laughs> type places. And if you can do that. Then, uh, um, then maybe you can actually pull off, um, you know, a, uh, a a healthy season. So, I'm I'm more hopeful now because there weren't a bunch of other outbreaks in inside Major League Baseball. Um, well, football has had football has had the luxury of watching everybody else try it, right? And in my opinion, that will help them. Uh, but the problem is that you've got a lot more bodies in football. Yeah. It's not like a basketball team that has, you know, 12 or 14 players or whatever they have. You know, you got 65 guys running around. You got practice squad guys. You got coaches, a million of them. You got uh, administrators. And so I think the problem has the potential to be a lot worse for football. Yeah. But at the same time, they've been able to watch an example of how to do it and how not to do it. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's going to take a lot of responsibility, and, and um, I hope they play the season. Um, you know, I'm optimistic they'll play the season. But just like anything uh, during the COVID era, uh, nothing would really surprise me at this point. I mean, I just, you know, I'd love to see it happen. You know, I, I'm in two fantasy football leagues. Um, I, I really enjoy Sunday afternoon. Uh, I'm not sure my family enjoys it as much as I do, but. Uh, but I, but I enjoy it, and it's a great, uh, energizing time of the year for me to just sit back and kick back and, um, and watch football. And so um, I'm hopeful, but at the same time, I'm, cautious, I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I am I, I, um, uh, really, really hopeful, though, that they'll, they'll um, be able to um, sort of get the season in. And, and like I said, I was definitely encouraged by – um, you know, some of the uh, Major League Baseball results, you know, sort of outside of those, um, those last, um, uh, the, those two uh, <laughs> night, nights out on the town incidents that uh, basically crushed, uh, crushed their, uh, their teams for, uh, for a couple weeks. Um, that, that being said, um, Brad, any last minute thoughts, anything else you want to say about last chance uh, you before we, uh, before we get out of here? Well, the first thing is I want you to visit my site, jcgridiron.com. It is the, uh, it is the only uh, full-service junior college football recruiting website that there is, and it's on the Rivals.com network. And, um, you know, we post stories on kids and who's recruiting them. Uh, throughout the year, we will have, during the spring, we have preseason All-America teams. We make four of them. Um, we have uh, regular season rankings of the teams, which is kind of funky right now because there's no football in the fall. Um, and then throughout the year, we switch things up with a lot of different things that we offer on the site. It's very inexpensive. And, uh, you know, if you really want to learn about the game of junior college football, it's the site to go to. And, you know, I like to say that I'm probably the number one proponent of the game. I think that uh, over the years, Junior college football has gotten kind of a, a bad rap, if you will. Um, you know, for years and years, all I've ever heard from viewers and people that post on sites and stuff is, oh, well, that's where the dumb kids go. And I'm here to tell you, 
junior college is not where the dumb kids go. Um, there's kids that have had unfortunate upbringings. Um, you have a lot of smart kids that maybe uh, they weren't the right size or the right speed coming out of high school. You've got other kids that are very good athletes, but they maybe weren't, they were on a poor high school team, so they didn't get a lot of visibility. And so you've got a lot of guys that are playing in the NFL that played at the junior college ranks. In fact, I think there's four defensive linemen alone that just played at East Mississippi College. And some of the greats in the game today started in the junior college ranks, whether it's Aaron Rodgers or Cam Newton or, uh, you know, you name it. There's, there's probably five or six guys on every single team that started playing junior college level. So um, I believe it is the best Saturday afternoon for dollar spent uh, thing that you can do if you're a football fan. I mean, I go to a game at like, let's say Riverside City College, which um, has a great program. They won my national title last year. Uh, you're probably going to see 15 Division One guys on the field. You're not, you're not going to see that in a high school game. And unless you're going to, like, the top five teams in the country, you're just not going to see that. Um, in the case of somebody like Riverside City College, in the junior college ranks, you'll see these schools pop up, and they'll have something that is just remarkable. Riverside City College has probably got the best marching band in the country at any level. They, they go on tour. They've been to Europe. They're in movies. And so – all these things happen, and you get in for like 10 to $12. And you've seen it, Dabba. You were there uh, back in our days, uh, back in the JUCO ranks. And, um, you know, you just see kids that are really, really hungry because as the show is called, it's their last chance. And it's the last opportunity to try and get that Division One deal or D2 school or get their education paid for, you know, whatever the case may be. So that's my spin. That's my final spin this afternoon. Uh, go sign up for jcgridiron.com. It'll be an education for you. If you don't like it, eh, just discontinue it. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, you know, I want to thank you, Brad. Um, it, was, it, was, it was great to get you on the, uh, the big, uh, finally get you. Yeah, you're, you're all Hollywood now. Uh, oh, to, yeah. You know me. You yeah, know me. I, you, you, know. you look like you're living on one of the, um, of the, the recent uh, thrown out sets from the middle <laughs> the TV hey, show. Well, let, me, I'll, let me give you a little view of this right here, Dabba. That is my wall, which I had some plumbing issues okay. outside, and I had to have my house completely repiped. So that's what it looks like when they tear out your wall and then they try to put it back together again, like Humpty Dumpty, you know? So, um, nice. Nice. Well, I, I, know, I, we're just trying to live through COVID, you know? No, I hear you. I, I hear you. Well, any, anyways, um, uh, uh, thanks so much for uh, for joining uh, uh, joining the big pod uh, today, Mr. Hoysat. Um, for Brad Hoysat, I am Dave DeBaugh. Uh, remember to check out the big mighty dot rip website when you have a chance. Thanks again for tuning in to the Mighty Rip Pod.